The battle for Iraq's second largest city. The army makes gains as the Prime Minister vows to retake Mosul by the end of the year. So how ready are government forces? What does the offensive mean for a united Iraq? What does it mean for ISIL? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. It's been an effective summer for Iraqi forces battling ISIL fighters. Now they're fighting to retake Iraq's second largest city, Mosul. It's been under ISIL control for more than two years. The Iraqi army, Kurdish forces, Shia militias and the U.S. Air Force all converging on the city from different directions. The Prime Minister, Haider al-Abadi, says it'll be captured by the end of the year. Iraqi soldiers retook Qayyara on Saturday. It's an oil-producing town that's only about 70 kilometers south of Mosul and near a major airbase. The Iraqi army had been fighting for control of Qayyara for several weeks. Well, losing control of Qayyara is a big loss for ISIL. Its territory in Iraq has shrunk by half over the past year, particularly over the past few months. Most of the land ISIL holds in Iraq is concentrated in the north, near the Turkish, in the Kurdish rather, region. But the Iraqi army has been steadily winning back land in that region as it makes its way towards ISIL's stronghold of Mosul. Let's bring our guests into the show now. We have in Baghdad Hassan al atiyah head of the Iraqi National Initiative, a secular movement that aims to bridge sectarian divides in the country. In the northern Syrian city of Qamishli, Vladimir van Wilgenberg, a journalist and political analyst focusing on Kurdish politics. And in Tunis, Zayd al-Ali, author of the book The Struggle for Iraq's Future and a former advisor to the United Nations. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Zayd. So ISIL, as we know, has been losing territory around Mosul. Can the city be recaptured by the end of the year? Yeah, I think basically based on my conversations with military experts over the past, past few months and also based on just regular observations on what's been happening on the ground, even without an expert's knowledge, it seems fairly obvious that Mosul has basically already fallen. The only thing that's holding it up now is uh, political discord, mainly in Baghdad and also elsewhere. Uh, ISIS's uh, capabilities of controlling territory and of, uh, certainly not of expanding territory, but certainly uh, controlling territory has basically been reduced, greatly reduced now over the past year, particularly as you say over the past few months. And it seems fairly obvious that Mosul will not be able to, they will not be able to defend and that it will be liberated before the end of this year. The question, however, and I expect that this is what we're going to be talking about during this program, becomes um, as much more importantly as becomes what happens after the liberation of Mosul and how can we repeat, uh, prevent a, uh, the emergence of Al-Qaeda 3.0. Absolutely, Zaid. That is uh, a question that we want no to question. get into. But before we fast track into that, I want to continue on the theme you mentioned and, and take the discussion to Vladimir in Kamishli. Vladimir, so uh, the, the view there from Zaid that practically speaking, the city has almost already fallen. Is this going to be an, an easy uh, way forward and the city we can expect will be in government hands by the end of the year? Do you agree with that analysis? Well, um, uh, ISIS is clearly uh, being slowly defeated. Uh, even the ISIS spokesperson admitted this in a speech uh, a few months ago. So I think it's also a question of time. Uh, the Iraqi forces uh, now got Qayyara, and Qayyara is a sort of the bridgehead into Mosul. And also the Peshmerga forces around uh, Mosul city, they control several points. The only thing they still have to do is encircle Mo Mosul completely, because there is still access from Mosul to the Iraqi border, to the Syrian border. So they first have to clear out this area and encircle it. But it's just a matter of time. But I think it's not going to um, end before uh, the US elections, which are going to take place in two or three months. Hassan, what is the plan for who is actually going to fight inside the city? Because Kurdish forces have said they're going to stop at the city's gates. The Hashda Shabi or popular mobilization units have said the same thing. Who's going to do the fighting street to street, if that's what it comes down to? Well, you just hit the point. The problem with al Mosul liberation is the day after. Who will be in control? Politically, militarily, and economically. 
Now the forces that are trying to have a foothold there all are thinking in terms of sectarian or ethnic ways. For some of the Kurds, this is an opportunity to get stronghold there or a rather a bargaining chip regarding other areas. Al-Hajj, which is basically a Shia force, they also want to make sure that the victor there will be allied to them. Similarly, the inhabitant there, they would like to see that they will be free and to control themselves rather than to be stooges either to the Kurd or to the central government or even to the Shia. This dilemma is facing everyone. That sounds like a real Mosul. mess, Hassan. Is, is there a plan? Is there an agreement uh, for who will run Mosul? I, I doubt it because uh, the Iraqi prime minister requested and asked that the Turk, the Kurds will not proceed further. But they said, no, the, the land that we control will be part of our area of control. Right. And that's a contradiction quite open in the media. Similarly, al Hashid doesn't abide by its own uh, government or the central government. So if you can, uh, describe the situation as a messy, I think this is an understatement. All right. Uh, since we're talking about al-Hashd or the popular mobilization forces, maybe it's important to remember that these forces have been at the forefront of the fight against ISIL in Iraq. The fighters are mostly Shia, many of them supported by the Iranian government. Now, they've been at the front line of Iraqi efforts to defeat ISIL forces, but they're also accused of attacking Sunni civilians. Now, this is a real issue, is it not, Zaid? Does Baghdad or anyone have a plan on the most basic question of how to make life better for the people of Mosul so that we don't have what you uh, hinted at, Al-Qaeda 3.0 or ISIL 2.0? Right, so uh, Hassan has already said that he doubts that there is a plan. And I think, I mean, so broadly speaking, that's right. Now, uh, in, in practice, there, the plan, in so far as one can speak of the existence of such a thing, is to uh, bring Mosul back into the current framework of governance in Iraq, so that Mosul will re-become a province uh, within the Iraqi Republic, as it was in the past, and then provincial elections, and that the Iraqi state will re-extend its control to that territory. Now, that's the current plan, because that's the only option that's available for Baghdad. Of course, the Kurds have their own alternative vision, which, uh, which Hassan has alluded to, which they may want to use as bargaining chips, perhaps, and so on and so forth. But broadly, what they want is to reestablish the system as it existed before, with some amendments, perhaps, uh, for the future. Now, the problem with that plan is that it's highly, highly inadequate. And the reason why that is is because the Iraqi governance system, the constitutional framework, the rule of law, the courts, and the police are highly inadequate, ineffective, corrupt, and so on and so forth. And they're barely better than they used to be. So, um, so who fills the vacuum? That's what the plan is. Sunni forces, you know, are they capable? Excuse of me? going in there and filling the vacuum and, and running the city? I mean, who, who fills the vacuum? No, 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 they wouldn't be. The only, the only force that would be capable of running the city in a, a competent enough manner in order to prevent the emergence of Al-Qaeda 3.0 would be a relatively well-functioning Iraqi state. That's the only thing that would, that would allow that to happen. But so far, currently, I have practically no confidence that that's in the offing at the moment. Because the types of reforms that would need to be uh, enacted in order for the Iraqi state to be competent enough to govern Mosul to prevent the emergence of Al-Qaeda 3.0 aren't on the table. There's no consideration. There's nothing that's actually been happening that would allow for that to happen. So what we're talking about is the emergence of the rule of law, relatively well-functioning police force with investigative capabilities that wouldn't torture people automatically, that would investigate crimes and stop arresting people randomly and not let terrorists go just because they pay bribes and so on and so forth, and also a relatively well-functioning well court system. None of that is in existence, and there's no current plan to create that sort of thing. And without the existence of the rule of law in Iraq, without the existence of a relatively functioning government that's relatively accountable, I'm not asking for Switzerland, I'm asking for something that's relatively functioning, then we should expect that in the next right. few years there will be the emergence of a new version of ISIS. Uh, sorry, if I can take the question to Vladimir. You've, uh, you've covered the Kurdish forces uh, pretty well. You're familiar with them. A functioning, effective, as Zaid called it, uh, Iraqi government doesn't seem to be on the table for Mosul, but the Kurds seem to be on the table in that area. They've already expanded their territory. Uh, Vladimir, 
by about 50%, thanks to the fight against ISIL with U.S. backing. Can the genie ever be put back in the bottle? Well, uh, the Kurdish forces, they have no interest in going inside Mosul. Uh, they are more interested in the areas around Kirkuk. Uh, that's the more main uh, priority. But also, they want to clear out uh, the Nineveh plains around Mosul. But they don't have a problem. Um, they don't have a problem to stay outside of the city. But they've pushed but the pretty Kurds westwards from the Kirkuk, haven't they? Because, uh, uh, the how past, far westwards? How far westwards can they continue to go, or do they want to go? Do you think? Well, the Kurds say they control 95% of the area they want to control. So I don't think they go much further. The only areas they still want to control are in the Nineveh plains, like Bashika, uh, some Bartella, uh, some like areas where it's mixed between Christians and Kurds and Yazidis, and also south of Sinjar. So I don't think they want to control more territory outside of Kirkuk or Tushkumato, but they are more focused on uh, the Nineveh plains and uh, south of Sinjar. Ghassan, uh, a spokesperson for the Kurdish regional government, said that the Peshmerga is not going to stop making advances uh, until, as he called it, all of Kurdistan's territories in the Nineveh region are, quote, liberated. And he went on to say that they're not even planning to withdraw from areas which uh, they plan to, in his words, liberate in the future. Surely this is setting up further, setting the stage for further conflict between the KRG, the Kurdish regional government, and Baghdad. Some Iraqis now are afraid of victory against Daesh because they think this might be a prelude to further damages and further crisis. That's I, among others. Now we are in the process of managing the crisis rather than solving the problem of Mosul. Managing it to be able to manage it in a step towards a solution or whatever it is, I think there is a need for international peace force to be in Baghdad, in Mosul. I know this suggestion is rather uh, more of a hope than a, a reality, but I am afraid that now is the time the international community commit themselves. By the way, Mosul future as part of Iraq was decided by international commission, which is called the Brussels Commission, which came to Iraq to settle the future of Mosul, right. whether it is Kurdi, whether it is Arab or Ottoman. Now we are in Iraq. I know it's very difficult. We need a breathing space. The European and the American would want to get rid of the ISIS. And the Arabs and the Kurds have their own problems. We need a breathing space. That's why I think a better approach. Now there is more of an understanding between the, right. the Turk and the Russian that an international force in Iraq will be in Mosul will be uh, helpful. All right, Vladimir, you were just saying something uh, when I cut you off, so go ahead. Well, what I was saying is that there were already clashes between uh, Shia militias and the uh, Kurdish Peshmerga forces, so there's a possibility again, especially if the Iraqi army uh, finishes Mosul, because Shia militias want to be involved in Mosul, especially they want to go to Tel Afar, and then they will be on the front lines with uh, Kurdish forces. So this creates a risk. If there's not a political settlement after Mosul, even before Mosul, there are going to be more problems in the future. So there has to be a political settlement if they don't want to have tensions in the future. This is an interesting point, especially what Ghassan said a minute ago, Zaid. And I wonder, what is the possibility, do you think, of this perhaps raising the scenario of increased Turkish uh, intervention in the region, especially if the Kurds are feeling more and more empowered? Sure. So, I mean, you know, I'm not the best person to ask that question to because I mean, the regional implications of Turkey and in, uh, in, in, in Iraq um, is, 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 is an issue that I don't really get into that much. My specialization, I specialize mainly in constitutional and rule of law issues. But, uh, but I mean, broadly speaking, what I can say, and I don't think there's going to be much controversy about this, is that Turkey has several interests in, in Iraq, one of them being to prevent the emergence of an independent Kurdish region, or Kurdish state, rather. Um, and so they would not want for uh, the Kurds to, uh, to extend the control of territory too far in a way that will allow them uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to get closer to their, uh, to, to their ambition of creating an independent state. And so the Turks will do what, it, what, what they consider to be necessary in order to prevent that. That's one. Something else also is that they'll also want to prevent um, the, uh, these irregular militias, as often referred to as Shia militias, from getting cl too close into Mosul in order to prop up and protect uh, Turkey's own 
uh, local allies, which are broadly represented in the, the, in the Nujefi, Nujefi faction in parliament and in the Ninua, in the Ninua Provincial Council. Um, so, so potentially, yes, there's a lot of potential for Turkey to, to be brought further into this dispute. And sadly, the more that that happens and the more actors pile into Mosul, and in the same way as more actors pile into Syria, what tends to happen is that people forget that right. what all this should be about is the individual and not, the, not these groups as if they're just uh, pawns on a, on a chessboard. Uh, let me take the point then back to Ghassan. You mentioned there the uh, convergence between Russia and Turkey. What about the common vision between Turkey and the U.S.? How much of a common vision is there between some of these outside powers who are heavily involved in Iraq's future? Well, unfortunately, we Iraqis are not in a position to sort our problem peacefully. We are so much divided sectarianly and, and ethnically. Without a regional help, we will really keep in this state of instability for decades. Now there is a chance if the Syrian problem is settled or brought to stability with the understanding between the American and Russian and the Iranian, I think this is a prelude could help and repeat itself in Iraq. In Iraq, without the involvement of Turkey and Iran, and on the other hand, the Soviet Union, the Ru Russia, and the American, it will be very difficult to find a solution, even in Iraq. On the other hand, we Iraqis, we have to have work hard in having a new Iraqi element, Iraqi voice. Now we have a Sunni, a Shia, a Kurdish voice, but we hardly have an Iraqi voice. In Iraq, there is a great attempt now to bring forward a new grouping which can be considered by others, not by themselves, as Iraqi. So if we have a voice called Iraqi, maybe this could be a conduit or rather a catalyst to bring other faction in. And this attempt is successful if the regional power understand that to their own benefit, such political number as Iraqis is not uh, hostile to the Iranian or Saudis or the Arab or the American or others. Because what we are envisioning now in Iraq, we would like Iraq, future Iraq, to be a state like Oman. Oman is a, uh, isolating itself from the problem of the region and playing as door more of a moderate uh, uh, role. And if the American, the Iranian would like to meet, they meet in Muscat or Oman. We are hoping in Iraq to the emergence of such a force in Iraq by Iraqis. And such a force will be helpful to the Iranian, to the Saudi, to the American, everyone else, to bring a moderate element in the Iraqi political scene. If we succeed in this, this might be help. That's why what is now we are facing in Mosul is to stabilize the situation here, maybe not solve it. Two, we would like to minimize, minimize the damage and the casualties. That's why they are thinking in giving the uh, ISIS way to live as they did in Qayyara, to leave right. Mosul without further damage. Vladimir, we've talked a lot about what Mosul means for Iraq. Let's talk about what it means for ISIL in terms of generating funding and revenue. Yeah, if ISIS lose Mosul, they will lose a lot of, uh, they lose their main capital. So uh, in Iraq, it will be over. But the problem there is still Raqqa and Syria. And Raqqa is not going to be captured soon by anti-ISIS forces because now the Turks and the Kurds are fighting over northern Aleppo. But if ISIS lose Mosul, at least in Iraq, ISIS will be finished and they will lose their revenues and they will lose their administration. So if they lose Mosul, it will be the final blow for ISIS, at least in Iraq. I'm not sure that Mosul is a source of revenue for ISIL anymore. It certainly was in the past before 2014 and up until maybe around about mid-2015 when the Iraqi government was still paying government salaries to its staff in Mosul. But since then, that city has now really been bled dry. There's, I don't know if there's really that much money to be taken out of that city by ISIS. Um, so at this stage, I mean, you know, in terms of revenue-making opportunities for ISIL, in terms of taxation and other forms of revenue-making opportunities, there's not going to be much left in Mosul. So it'll be a big blow for the organization to lose Mosul from a strategic perspective, and it's the way in which it's perceived by the jihadi milieu. But in terms of money and cash, I mean, this is not, you know, the French Riviera. This is, Mosul now is a devastated city, and people will not have a lot of cash to spare to pass up, up, up until to, to, to ISIL. Well, so they, I, I on, on the point then of the prestige and morale then, I mean, can ISIL still claim to be ISIL, you know, a state, Islamic state of Iraq? 
and the Levant if it loses Mosul? No, clearly not, right? So, I mean, as Vladimir just said right now, its days in Iraq are numbered, and they have been numbered for a long time. The question is just a matter of when, not if. It's, you know, they will be pushed out of Iraq. I can't speak to, to Syria, but the question about Iraq is basically settled. The only question that's left now is this question of, if, of when. And, um, and when that happens, then we'll have to wait and see over the next few years how things emerge in Iraq. It's not looking good, as I've already said. Um, and also, we're going to have to look and see um, if terrorist attacks continue in Baghdad or elsewhere in Iraq for a long period of time, how the Iraqi state will eventually react to that and whether or not they will eventually become a major player in Iraq as, in Syria as well. Because that's something that eventually will be on the cards if the situation doesn't change. And that can also lead to all sorts of lots of negative repercussions and complications of their own. But in terms of ISIS and its role in Iraq, in terms at least this version of ISIS, basically it's over now at this stage. And I think we can be grateful for that at least. Oh, uh, but briefly then, Vladimir, will it really be over for ISIL or do they turn into some kind of underground fighting force? Well, I think uh, even if, if ISIS is finished in Mosul, they can still carry out terrorist attacks. And uh, the problem is also, I've also visited uh, the schools uh, from ISIS that um, I've seen their documents because I was recently in Mombich in Syria. They have educated a new generation of jihadis. So um, it's also another problem just of military defeating ISIS. It's also a problem of, about the ideological war. So um, there's no guarantee that in, in ISIS in Iraq could be finished. And maybe in a few years, we will have a similar organization. And even Al-Qaeda now says they are interested in coming back to Iraq and, and waging a guerrilla warfare in, in Iraq. So this, this is not over yet. All right. What about the humanitarian crisis, Ghassan, which uh, the push for Mosul might intensify? Is the country ready for tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing Mosul? Well, this is part of the problem in Iraq. Defeating uh, ISIL militarily may be the easy part, but defeating ISIL as a concept, as an ideology, is the big fight. How to win the heart and mind of the inhabitant, particularly the Arab Sunnis. This is the big problem. And here we are facing a problem, whether in Syria or in Iraq, who represents and who speaks on behalf of the moderate Arab Sunnis. And the other th thing is, can we succeed in establishing a situation in, in Iraq, a Sunni areas like Ramadi, like Salah al-Din, and then in Mosul, which will be an exemplary case where the Sunni will feel themselves free and equal with others. Succeeding in this, this will be the biggest blow to ISIL. But if we fail, as we failed in some areas in Iraq, especially in Salah al-Din, to make the people there to feel that they are now feel to be equal citizen with everyone else, then ISIL will come back again. The other point I would like to point out, we need a breathing space for us to move there. The ISIL, without territory, they can turn into wolf gangs. And this is what's already been seen in, in Europe. In addition to that, they moved uh, to, uh, uh, to North Africa, to Libya and other area. The pr bigger problem is to f to really defeat the ideology, the idea, and the idea will not be defeated unless with, but with counter ideas. Fascism is not defeated only when right. democracy became a good example. Example. So, what is the example we have to defeat the ISIL? Is the big question. That is a good question. Perhaps one we pick up on another show of Inside Story. For now, let's thank our guests very much: Ghassan Al Atiyah, Vladimir Van. Bilgenberg and Zaid Al Ali. And thank you too for watching. As always, you can see the show again anytime by heading over to our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story.